didn't know what I was doing in those days, and I thought, well, it's been an interesting experiment. Of course, now <laughs> I know, and you're going to find out when I do more ta talks in the future, now I know time is not linear. It is really parallel times and parallel dimensions, and things are all really all existing at the same time. But in those early days of my beginning, I was still thinking everything was linear, like one year after the other, one month after the other, our linear way of thinking, the way we go through life now. And I still prefer to think of it that way because otherwise it's a little too complicated for our poor little brains. <laughs> but um, I was jumping her back and back and back until finally we came to this life where she was an Essene teacher. And uh, at the time, I knew who the Essenes were because I remembered when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran, in the caves by Qumran in Israel, back at the end of the 40s and the beginning of the 50s. And they said it was the greatest discovery in the history of mankind because it was the earliest known um, manuscripts, I guess you would say, of the Bible chapters. So it was a very valuable find, and the scholars all gathered over there, and they were trying to interpret these. But that's when everything began to get uh, go downhill, because they began to find out that what they were finding in these old, old manuscripts was contradicting what the church was teaching. It was contradicting what was in the Bible. And when I did my research to write the book, Jesus and the Essenes, I had to read every book ever written on the Dead Sea Scrolls. I do this when I do research. I do tremendous amount of research, and I read every book ever written on the Dead Sea Scrolls to find out what they were coming up with. And one of them said, I wish you would just go away and come back in another generation because it was contradicting what they had been taught. Now, there was a board of people who were going over the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, the ones they had found, piecing them together, because many of them were in fragments, and trying to translate. They were very fragile. And as they began to get this, there was a, the board put up of different people who were the ones in charge of this. All of these were theologians. They all belonged to different churches. There was only one who was not a member of the church. And he was the one who revealed the real stories of what they were finding. He let things leak out too soon. They didn't want people to know these things because they were really getting frustrated and confused about it. And they were questioning their own belief system. This man began telling people what within the uh, scrolls they were translating. And he wrote several books. <laughs> I guess the name is going to come to me in a minute because I wasn't prepared to mention it. Usually in a lecture I had it at the tip of my head, on my, my mind, but it'll come to me in a minute. But he wrote several books about the, his versions of what they were finding in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, when they found out that he was leaking this information, they put him off of the board. And he was never again allowed to even see the Dead Sea Scrolls and have any part in it because they didn't like the way he was uh, telling it too soon. And his, that way, we were able to get a true picture of what they were finding. But the rest of them all said, no, we're not going to reveal this. So it was like it was all shut up back in the caves again. Everybody kept thinking, what happened to this wonderful discovery that they said they had found? The greatest discovery in the history of man. What happened to this discovery? Well, there was no more heard about it. And it was only in the last few years, they said after 40 years of people saying, what's happening, that finally they're beginning to release some more of the information. And I can believe it's probably very select, very uh, just pieces of it that they're allowing people to know about. But one of them said, this can't be. There was Christianity before Christ. 
And, you know, the church has always said it all began with Christ, and that is not what we found. He actually got his teachings and his learning and his information from other groups, especially the mystery school called the Essenes that existed at that time at Qumran. They were, he was te- be taught by people. He was taught by the wisest teachers in the world. And this is where his uh, knowledge and his abilities came from. But the church wanted people to think he just appeared one day with all of this knowledge and abilities, like he came straight from God. That was not what happened at all. He was taught by people. And um, this is what I found when I was doing the regressions and putting it all together for the book. And it was later, after Jesus and the Essenes had been printed, and it had to come from England, because I was trying to get this published at a time when there wasn't any New Age bookstores. It was in the, uh, the 80s, and in the regular bookstores, they only had one more small shelf reserved for this kind of material. It was very difficult to get this kind of material printed. But everything has to happen in its time. So it ended up, the book Jesus and the Essenes was printed in England. And that's the way it had to come. It had to come into the back door to get into America. So when I, the book was finally published, my publisher knew he was taking a chance. He told me he was. This was Alex Bartholomew, and he was with Gateway Publishers in England. And for many, many years before that, he worked in America, and he was the one that was responsible for publishing Jonathan Livingston Seagull, the uh, masterpiece that uh, is now, they're trying, you know, there was into a movie, and they're trying to get Richard Bach's Illusions now into a movie. But that was the original. He said at that time he was taking a chance because everybody said, this is a book about a a seagull? doesn't make any sense. You're going to take a chance on that. But he was always willing to take chances, and his paid off when he was in the United States, and he was responsible for publishing Jonathan Livingston Seagull. When he founded his own company in England, and he'd been there for many years, and that was when he decided, he said, to take a chance on me and my book. He said, Jesus and the Essenes. He wasn't sure how it would be accepted. He thought people might ridicule it. They might not understand. They may not understand the method that it came about through hypnosis because this was in the days there wasn't much of this going around. But he said he decided to take a chance. Well, when he did, to his amazement, the book took off, and it went through several printings in England before it is now returned to the United States, and it, I have the rights back to it now, and it's being printed as another edition in the United States. But he always told me it was such a fantastic book. Well, after that, one time he called me and he said, do you have any more material about the life of Jesus? And I said, yes, I did. I had been accumulating some after that book was written. And he says, write it. But he said, I don't think you're going to be able to surpass a masterpiece. So I began to put together material that was other material that I got from two other women. Now, Jesus the Essenes was the young girl going back to a lifetime where she was Sudi, one of the teachers, the Essene teachers at Qumran. And she was one of the ones that taught Jesus and John the Baptist um, in their early days, all the material they learned at Qumran. She was a master of the Torah. And I had to find out what all of this was, and I talked about this last week, of what that was. That's the first five books of the Bible, and it talks about the Jewish law. And that was what she was in that past life. In this life, she was Pentecostal, and I said she had never even finished uh, high school. But here she was giving us Jewish teaching, theology, and Jewish culture customs. But then I had two other women that I was working with after that book was published. And they told us what it was like to be with Jesus when he was on his ministry. 
giving it a totally different slant. Jesus and the Essenes is a, is a masculine energy. They walk with Jesus is a feminine energy. <laughs> because the one woman went back to where she was um, a wise woman who had been taught, I believe, by the Essenes, but she was in uh, the, the uh, temple in Jerusalem, and she was trying to teach there well, being a woman, the rabbis pushed her down and said, no, she wasn't worth it. They couldn't allow her to teach. So they let her teach the children. They figured she wouldn't do any damage there. And she was, her, all of her knowledge, she felt, was just going to waste. But in her experience, she met Jesus when he was uh, talking to the people on the steps of the great temple in Jerusalem. And we got a great deal of information about the temple and what it looked like and its construction. A lot of, about that that proved to be true later. Where she was teaching the children with singing and dancing on the steps on one side of the temple, he was teaching to the people on the other side of the temple. So it talks about the miraculous experience she had with meeting Jesus at that time because she was so felt so oppressed with all of this knowledge trapped up inside of her. And Jesus seemed to be able to recognize that as though it was a kindred, kindred soul, because Jesus was also lonely and felt misunderstood. He felt he was in a time and place when people didn't understand what he was trying to say and rather lost, and here he had met someone who really understood and was also having to oppress great knowledge. So it's a wonderful story of their meeting. That's one of the women that is in They Walked With Jesus. The other one was a young Jewish girl in this life. She was raised Jewish, didn't even know anything about the story of Jesus or about his life or anything. So that was amazing that she was giving me the finishing up stories that she didn't even know, finishing the last pieces of a story she had no knowledge of. But to me, that gave it more validity because it wasn't like a Christian person saying, oh, I want to go back and live at the time of Jesus. This was a Jewish woman who had no idea about any of this. She said, later, it's almost comical. Why would I choose to have a life like that? But in that story, where she was reliving her life with Jesus, she was Jesus' niece. And this is where part of the lost history came in, was that Joseph, uh, Mary was not his first wife. He was married to someone else before that. And if you know the story, Joseph was much older than Mary. She was only about 16 when Jesus was born. And Joseph was a much older man. So it couldn't be hard to um, believe that he had had another wife. And the wife had died is the way the story came out. And then it was later that he got with Mary and the the story of the birth of Jesus came about. But when he was married to the first wife, he had a son by the by her. And this son was called Joseph, which went along with the tradition over there. The first son is usually called named after the father. And this um, son, Joseph, lived in Jerusalem. And he, where Jesus was a carpenter, Joseph worked with metal. And so the two of them would work together many times. And he would come to this brother's house in Jerusalem and meet there and, and visit 